Here's a quote for you. Quote, say what you will, the trial is the best picture I ever made, unquote. Well, Orson Welles said that. Uh, a lot of people didn't agree with him. Uh, the trial was not a hugely successful picture, uh, critically or financially, but I think he had something. In 1961, Orson Welles directed, adapted for the screen, and acted in a little scene but nonetheless amazing and brilliant version of Franz Kafka's nightmarish novel of guilt, law, and paranoia, The Trial, starring Anthony Perkins as Joseph Kay, Rami Schneider, Jean Moreau, Akim Tamirov, Elsa Martinelli, and Welles himself as the advocate. Joseph K. I didn't notice so. So, so you, you came to see me about this case. That's good. When I first met Orson Welles about eight years later, of course, we talked about his films, and being made to feel very comfortable in his presence then, I remarked that out of all his pictures, there was really only one I didn't like, and that was The Trial. He said, I don't either. But a couple of months later, when I'd gotten to know him better and again mentioned my opinion of the trial, he said, I wish you wouldn't keep saying that. Oh, I said, I thought you didn't like the picture either. No, he said, I just said that to please you. I like it very much. But since I have respect for your opinion, since I also haven't made many pictures, every time you denigrate it, you diminish my small treasure. Well, of course, I felt terrible, and Orson rubbed it in from then on by always afterward referring to the trial as that picture you hate. The film, generally quite faithful to Kafka's novel, tells the bizarre story of a young office worker accused of and tried for an unspecified crime in a nightmare world from which you can infer that the motto might echo Shakespeare's line, first kill all the lawyers. As usual in this picture, Wells is the heavy, a famous attorney, to Perkins' strangely guilty innocent man. I think you're very uncomfortable, don't I? You don't like what you see, do you? It's my mouth. You think you can tell from my mouth that I'm condemned, that I'm going to be found guilty? One day, a few years after we'd met, Orson said, You know why you don't like the trial? You haven't seen how funny it is, how funny I meant it to be. Tony Perkins and I were laughing all the way through shooting. And, to prove his point, he invited me to go with him to a special screening of the trial in Paris, a black tie affair at which Orson was being honored. Well, at this running, sitting beside Wells, of course, I picked up his intentions quite clearly, and the two of us were laughing at any number of scenes that no one else in the somewhat stuffy audience found remotely funny. They were shushing Orson and me throughout. But then it is certainly the blackest kind of comedy. Orson told me later that on Paris's Bohemian Left Bank, there was a screening at which everyone laughed. When, when you played Joseph Kay in, the, in that film, what was your sense of Wells? Well, we spent uh, um, 16 hours together uh, every day, seven days a week. Uh, we got up in our respective uh, hotel suites and met for breakfast and drove to the set together with my car following empty uh, just behind. We spent the day together on the set. We walked off and had uh, lunch together at a little restaurant nearby. We spent the afternoon together. We had dinner together and then we went out night clubbing and drinking him, not me, uh, until the wee hours of the morning. Uh, so I, there, was a, there was a synthesis of, uh, of people there that was very, very strong, much stronger than the movie. I think the movie is a bit of a mess. Really? Mm. Did Wells also share that thought, or were you too thick into the production? for him to think about how it would cut together? I don't know uh, what went on in his head, but the concept of a, of a guilty Joseph K, a, a sort of obsequious and weak um, uh, hero seemed very anti uh, antithetical to the uh, spirit of Kafka's book and to the other dramatizations of it that had been done by uh, most uh, principally by Jean-Louis Barrault in the French theater. Uh, after a couple of days of shooting, I mentioned to Orson, I said, you know, don't you think it, uh, it's maybe going to be interpreted that uh, Joseph K. is guilty? He said he is guilty. He's guilty as hell. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I noticed there were classical elements of the music and the score and also jazz, and I was wondering how you decided on the different elements and where each type of music would go in the film. There are two ways of answering that kind of question. One is pompously to pretend that I had a master plan, and the other is to admit that uh, I put it in where I thought it would sound good, you know. Uh, which sounds like begging the question, but is the truth. The uh, basis, of course, is the, uh, is the Gesualdo. 
which is the basic music of it, which became a hit as a result of that. Nobody had ever heard it. And there was one very limited record of it. And after that, it was in Europe, it was played all over like a hit tune. In fact, a lot more people heard that music than saw the movie anywhere. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary piece of music because it's a, it's a, it's got musical ideas in it that didn't turn up again for 200 years. And it's a curiously romantic for Baroque music. And uh, full of doom and, and uh, beauty. And I liked it for the picture. I don't know if I would now. As you notice, I came in afterwards. I never like to see my movies because I like to remember them as being so much better than they really were. <laughs> and that's true. What inspired you to make the trial? <laughs> well, that's a story. I take you to the mountains of Austria where with my family I was uh, enjoying the winter sports hoping I would be able to pay the hotel bill at the end of it and had just completed being interviewed by Oriana Fallaci who had stated in the Italian press that I was undoubtedly the next American president. <laughs> my constituency at the time consisted of my wife and daughter so I didn't see much future in it uh, for me and the White House and I was waiting for the phone to ring as it which is what all of you will be doing if all of you are rash enough to go into the film business and a family of people called the Salkins came into my life they are a dynasty of filmmakers old man Salkin who was an adorable little old gentleman who hadn't paid a bill in about 32 years <laughs> but loved movies genuinely loved movies and his son Alexander came to see me now the old man Salkin has gone to dwell beyond the morning stars and Alexander is a sort of dean of the Salkin tribe because it's his son who has made the supermans and the millions and millions and so on that the Salkins have made. The old man, the adorable old man, had made the, a famous movie, at least in my youth in the textbooks on movies, it was considered a great movie, which was the Don Quixote of Shalyapin. And he had made the first Garbo movie. And he had a distinguished career. They had then escaped from Europe and become Mexican film producers where they'd made uh, about 40 Mexican pictures, the quality of which I, I, I'm not prepared to speak about. Uh, they arrived in this little tiny Austrian Alpine village in a taxi cab. <laughs> And they said, we have here a list of movies we are ready to finance. You pick up the, out the one you like. They didn't say, what do you want to make? They said, here is our list. And I said, I couldn't add to this list any. No, they said, here they are. And there were about 82 titles, most of which were impossible. And the most likely of which was the trial. So I said, we'll do the trial. So we made the trial. I should explain that uh, in my reading of the book, and of course everybody reads the book as a different book, and my reading is probably more wrong than a lot of people's, I see the monstrous bureaucracy, which is the villain of the piece, as not only Kafka's clairvoyant view of the future, but his racial and cultural background 
of being occupied by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I see the, a curious combination of the book of an unthinkably sterile future combined with an unthinkably dusty accumulation of, of those traditions which bureaucrats set up in order to perpetuate their, their monstrous lives. If I sound like our president, I profoundly apologize. <laughs> Uh, in this film, Joseph K. runs down that hallway with those alternating arched mirrors, and in Citizen Kane, that famous sequence down. Mirrors. In in that archway where she appears in between. Oh yes. And yes. we get the mirrors in Lady from Shanghai and in Citizen Kane. I wonder if you would comment on, uh, maybe, uh, uh, on the the frequency of multiple mirrors that you use in 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 a number of your films, in which a man, usually a man, but a character in distress, sees himself over and over and over in these mirrors. The camera is a peculiar kind of mirror, and that uh, turning the mirror on it seems to me a kind of a magical thing to do. I was wondering whether you thought there was a, a, enough sympathy for the main character in this film. I find in the book repeated indications that Kay is a pusher on his way up the bureaucracy, not Mr. Zero in the adding machine, not little Mr. Nobody, not the poor little faceless accountant, but a young man very anxious to get ahead in this awful world and doing his best to do that, and therefore in a state of, uh, of real neuroses because he is both terrified of and anxious to conquer the same thing. I recognize that I did Tony, who is a, one of the best actors we have, a, a great disservice, because he deserved to have made a tremendous success, and if he didn't with the critics, the blame is 100% with me. In the making of Othello, you said you believed in the existence of evil. And the evil here in this film seems to be from within man, from its, his people, his laws, his buildings. It seems as if you're saying in this film that evil comes from within man and not from outside, from nature. Uh, I do indeed believe in the existence of evil. And uh, to that extent, I'm at odds with uh, most of the people, especially of my generation. Uh, I think evil is a force so great that it is beyond me to decide whether it is generated entirely within man or whether it is a condition, a contagion, as well as, uh, as something that we generate within ourselves. The power of it is so great that uh, uh, it humbles me. It's, uh, the metaphysics are beyond me on that. I could, uh, I'd like to sit at a coffee table and argue it, but I wouldn't like to be on a distinguished dais of this kind in a great university uh, saying something for quotation on such a majestic theme. Um, one of the changes you made in the story was at the, ver at the very end when Joseph K. is killed, he's killed in a, a very alarmingly different way than in the book. and. I was really curious as to why you changed both the way he was killed and the way he was acting when he died. Because the, the book, book was written before the Holocaust. And I couldn't bear the defeat of Kay in the book after the Holocaust. I'm not Jewish, but uh, we are all Jewish since the Holocaust. And I couldn't bear for him to submit to death, as he does in Kafka, masochistically submit to death. It, it, uh, it stank of the old Bra Prague ghetto to me. And I had to, let him, I had to let him shout out defiance until he was blown up.
film, the computer is portrayed as sort of a dumb adding machine. The people manipulating it are the ones evil. Uh, is that your belief about the computer, that it's merely a big adding machine and that it's not intrinsically evil itself? The question is interesting because there's an enormous scene in the picture which was cut out by me two hours before the opening night in Paris which was a scene about the computer which would have more fully explained my attitude at that time about computers my attitude has changed slightly but only slightly since then and uh, I believe that the what that scene did which had uh, uh, played uh, almost nine minutes and as I say, I cut it out in the afternoon of the opening. What that scene did was to show man's slavish relationship to something which is really only his tool. And that was a splendid thing to say, but it turned out to be a, rather a drag in the picture. So I took it out. What is uh, the reason that you like to dub the voices of minor characters in your films, and which characters did you dub in the trial? I don't like to dub the minor characters. But uh, uh, by the time we get to dubbing, there usually isn't any more money, particularly if you're working with the Salkins at that period. And uh, uh, as in the case of Othello, where I did play practically the whole my supporting cast, uh, it was uh, economic because you don't get a you don't get a good actor for free to go into a dark room and spend all day trying to lip sync, you know. It's a thankless job. Why did you choose for yourself the role of the advocate and not one of the accused? I didn't want to play the advocate. I didn't want to be in it. And you would be astonished at the different people I offered it to, including uh, Gleason. I did. I played the advocate because uh, there was no other actor uh, of my caliber that I could afford. <laughs> but I enjoyed doing it. Once I saw Romy in that white uh, uh, nurse's uniform, I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> we have uh, the lady there. Yeah, how, much, how much obligation do you feel to a mass audience? I would love to have a mass audience. You're looking at a man who's been searching for a mass audience. <laughs> and if I had, a, had one, I'd be obliged. That's all I can say. <laughs> Obviously this one, but a number of other ones generate a sort of a palpable feel of oppression. Are you as pessimistic as that seems to indicate, or is that just what you like to do? Am I as what? As pessimistic as would seem to be indicated by the, the feeling of oppression in the trial and the sort of visual oppression that comes over in a number of uh, your other pictures. I am a profound pessimist. Uh, with a sentimental inclination to hope that uh, Pangloss was right and that I'm wrong. I have a sentimental inclination toward hope I believe in bravery and uh, worship it. To me, it's one of the, the greatest virtues there are. And the fact that I'm a pessimist is part of what gives bravery such an importance to me. Don't call me a macho. That's not what I'm talking about. Every time I see this film, I'm so struck by the brilliant use of space in so many of the environments, and yet in the Kafka story, all the spaces seem very cramped. I, w I wondered if you would talk about what led you to change the conception of space. Was it the different medium or your own vision? I, I thought that I was being uh, faithful to, a, uh, to my reading of the book, and uh, I know that nobody agrees with me, including those people who like the picture as well as those who dislike it. But I did not consciously uh, change what I thought was its essential meaning. What do, you, um, what do you see as the role of seduction in bureaucracy? There seem to be lots of 
uh, sexual symbols, um, or sexuality is almost the second, uh, is almost the antagonist, along with the bureaucratic oppression. I would be happy to have 40 years of movie making ahead of me in which it would never be necessary for me to ask the leading man to take his pants off, you know. Uh, but the eroticism in, in Kafka is, uh, is, is inevitable. You have been quoted uh, as, uh, in an interview that was taken before the trial was filmed that you did not think that you would be the man to film the trial. Tonight you have said that uh, you took the trial on own practically because it was the least intolerable prospect offered to you. I would say that the main character is somewhat less passive than the characters I've read in Kafka. Uh, taking all that together, do you think that your world vision is uh, close to Kafka's? Uh, and do you think that's uh, something to take into consideration for you to make a movie out of his work? I, you know, he was a creature uh, born entirely of the uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, of, uh, of, his, uh, of his own people, his own religion, uh, the, uh, between the two world wars. Uh, there's every possible difference between us. We could not possibly have the same vision. Even if our genes were the same, there's no way we could see the world the same uh, at, at this different moment in the turning of the globe. And therefore, you will say I shouldn't have made the picture, and there's no answer to that either. Right. Did you go to the set each day not knowing what you were going to, uh, where you were going to plop the camera down, or in I rehearsal? do, I do. I think, I believe I'm the only director that I know of who does this particular thing, which is probably the worst way to go about it. I didn't begin this way but I have developed this way. I light a set before I decide where anybody will go with the, ca with the cameraman. And then when the set looks right to me, I put the actors where I think they ought to be. I don't put the actors and then light the set. It's the exact opposite. Because the set is all we have besides the actors and, uh, and it, it ought to have a chance. And, and the only way to give it a chance is to begin with it. That's my theory, anyway. All right. With um, with all the escapist movies that that have, that have come out in the last few years, is there some topic that you would like to make into a movie that to to retaliate against all of this uh, BS? To retaliate against uh, escapist movies? I love escapist movies. <laughs> I, I love it. I see I see no obligation on the part of a of a of a, a filmmaker. To, uh, to be serious, uh, uh, or even to be uh, adult. I think it's very nice to make movies for children and to make movies for the child which is in every grown person. My difficulty with, with uh, science fiction movies, I used to write it for my living when there was a thing called the Pulps which only the most elderly of you will even recognize as a word. But I was a pulp writer, and I used to write lobster men from Mars and all that. <laughs> and uh, I have a certain uh, notoriety uh, in the science fiction field. But uh, it's never been anything I like very much, because I don't believe in the future. <laughs> that doesn't mean I think we're, everything's going to end at this moment. But I think this future is a total hypothesis. I believe in the present insofar as we can grab it, and the past. And the, anything about the future, I don't believe. All they've got to do is put on one of those, those uh, bike helmets, you know, and silver things and start uh, off into the world of, uh, of optical printing, and I'm up the aisle, you see. <laughs> And not because they're bad movies, but because I don't respond. I didn't like westerns until I was about 50 years old. And I began to see them rerun on television. I never went to them as a child. And I, now I adore them. And I might learn to like, uh, uh, you know, Zing Zing and Up in Outer Space. But it, uh, for the moment it doesn't say anything to me. But I'm in favor of them. I think it's fine. I don't think that if, if, as long as they are not... Uh, violent for the sake of violence or, or uh, 
uh, in any way fascistic in their tone as long as they partake of a myth or of the mythic quality which a film can can call upon I think it's a marvelous exercise in uh, virtuosity and I immensely admire the people who make them. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about the ending, how you arrived at it? Uh, you told us a little bit why, but how did you come upon the ending as you did? I wanted Kay to make a final gesture, even if it was fruitless. Uh, you know, if, if we want to be, if we want to pin a label on it, it's existentialist. Uh, I couldn't bear for him to have his throat split like a pig, and uh, he throws the he throws the grenade back, uh, which is a which is a way of saying no. And it seems to me seemed to me that putting a man in a hole with a bomb, and letting him try to throw the bomb out, expressed that as well as I could think it was as simple a way of stating it as I could think of. I have a question about your coverage of scenes. You've been noted for many rather exceptional long takes such as the boarding house sequence in Kane or the first sequence in the room in this film. Do you customarily cover everything in a match? I cover said? nothing. Okay. Cover nothing. Never cover. So you mean when, when we see on the screen a long take, does that mean that that's all you've shot? That's all there is. Okay. Much I was taught that by Jack Ford, uh -huh. <laughs> because when, 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 when Ford finished a movie, he never cut it, you know? He had nothing to do with the editing. He never went into the moviola. He never saw a rough cut. He usually went on a big drunk. <laughs> and the way he had of protecting himself was to give them nothing to go to. <laughs> so if he wanted the... If he wanted the girl to say, yes, Duke, that was all she got to say. She didn't get to listen to all the rest of the scene or say the dialogue that he expected her not to say. That's all he shot. And he told me to do it, and I followed his instructions. As long as we're still talking about the uh, long takes, um, I was wondering if that tendency in the films is more out of... Uh your roots in the theater and presenting something in real time or was it more for an expressionist uh, reason? Depends on two things. A very good technical crew and there are less of them every day in the world, all over the world because of television. And very good actors. The longest, I've done very long, I've done, I did the first real length takes that were ever made. And uh, they ended up not that because they cut into them in Ambersons, but they were real length. And in Macbeth, they are real length, full real in length. I believe that uh, it is an enormous help to a cast, if they're good enough, to play the rhythm of an entire sequence uh, rather than uh, leaving it to the director entirely. Because the uh, director has... I always suspect a little bit too much power in movie making. Maybe I'm an incurable optimist, but I got a lot of hope out of the picture, um, partly out of the character's integrity and, and that he was kind of a hero in his integrity and things and he wouldn't stand for things. Did you mean for a lot of hope to come I out of that? I am a kind of optimist that believes in integrity and in all, the, all, these, all these virtues which uh, illuminate Western civilization and which are only I hope temporarily out of fashion uh, I don't believe that these uh, that the that the um, physical outlook uh, of mankind changes virtue and only uh, obliges us to behave better I, know. I was uh, noticing <laughs> continuity between the, uh, the trial and a lot of your films dating back to uh, Citizen Kane as your view seems to be opposed to some of the best interests of the corporate elite of which you speak directly about in uh, the trial. And I was wondering if you thought your personal financial position as a film director is directly related to 
the fact that a lot of your views and your films throughout these ages have not uh, exactly expressed their interests. <laughs> Would anybody like to answer that question? Uh, uh, well, my personal opinion. <laughs> Good. Stand up. Let's hear it. <laughs> my personal opinion is that it's true, and that uh, from the, what I've read from your career, although I wasn't alive at the time you first were making films, that uh, <laughs> that you've had a tremendous problem with uh, the press and corporate bureaucracy dating back, you know, since the earliest portions of your career. And that this is continuing today, and that's one of the reasons why you've been unable to finish uh, some of your more recent projects. Well, the only, uh, there, there are only two main projects which are unfinished. One is uh, uh, the other side of the wind, and when I tell you that my partner in that project is the brother-in-law of the late Shah of Iran, you will understand why we are having a little legal difficulty. <laughs> the other unfinished film is Don Quixote, which was a private exercise of mine. And it will be finished as an author will finish it at my own good time, when I feel like it. It is not unfinished because of financial reasons. And when it is released, its title is going to be, When Are You Going to Finish Don Quixote? <laughs> Yes, there's a, there's a hand going up. Look at that. I appreciate so very much your use of depth of field, especially in this film. My question is, why do you think that it's being dropped in filmmaking today? You never get the same depth of field in color as you do in black and white. And uh, secondly, a lot of the depth of field in, the, in Kane was fake. It was split screen. People, you know, we made up, we said we'd invented a new lens. That was just publicity. No truth in it at all. What was it called, Dick? We had some great word for it, I've forgotten. And it was a fake. Whenever the shot became impossible, we, we did the old split screen. Uh, yes. I, I was wondering why in the prologue to the film, each, I was wondering why in the prologue to the film you chose to use the pin screen technique when there really wasn't that much actual animation, instead of just using charcoal paintings or something. Oh, this is the attempt. This is the attempt to destroy him, to destroy his, his faith, to destroy his character. That, that fairy story is part of the plot against him. We are all told fairy stories. Some of those fairy stories are in TV commercials. Some of them are in presidential addresses. Some of them are uh, uh, in editorials, some of them are, are uh, in skywriting, and uh, that prologue, which by the way was made by a couple of wonderful mad Russians living in Paris, and they make their, they make their pictures by putting pins into blocks of wood, little needles, and the needles are at different degrees of depth, so that when a light falls on it, you get the light and shadow from the pins or the needles. That's what those extraordinary pictures come from. And I thought they gave a, a, uh, a suf in other words, that was the marriage to the Brothers Grimm. And we repeat the story when, uh, when I attempt again to corrupt him. I'm, the, I'm his chief corrupter, I'm the devil. If the fable is a lie, and what Hassler says are also lies. Why do you tell the story at the beginning of the movie in character as yourself? The film is contained, the, the life of this man is contained within a lie. We do not have the kind of novel in which a character leaves a real or benign world and enters a world of nightmare. He was born into it conceived in the womb of horror. That's why I begin with it. In other words, he can't escape because that's where he was born, any more than a baby in Bangladesh uh, can escape dying of starvation. 
You, you've made today continuous references to Spain when you talked about bravery, when you talked about Don Quixote, when you talked about your project as talking of Spain. I, I think I once read that you wanted to become even a bullfighter. What I didn't you want to, I was one. I love Americana. Hard to believe. I did it. I did it by buying the bulls. <laughs> what I wanted to know is what does Spain culturally represent for you? Uh, anybody of my generation, Spain means it means enormous things you cannot possibly appreciate because uh, the Spanish Civil War was the central was the central uh, uh, tragedy of of anybody's life who is my age. And it's hard to explain to anybody who's younger, but there it is. I remember your, your eulogy to Jean Renoir a couple of years ago in the Los Angeles Times, and I was wondering if you'd share with us your feelings on the passing of Abel Gantz a couple of days ago. It's a very painful, very painful question for me, because I have enormous respect for his inventiveness and his originality, but he is not in my top list of directors, and the fact that he died does not change that. Sorry. I, I made his last picture with him, and that my opinion is not from that picture. It's based on Napoleon. He was a man obsessed. He had a magnificent obsession. He had an enormous visual sense. He contributed incredibly to our vocabulary in the cinema, but I'm much more interested in, uh, in uh, movies about people. And I don't think he made one. Napoleon is a big subject, and it can be dealt with with a cast of 20 people. Did you have any particular reason for updating the trial into the 1960s? I, 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 I tried to do uh, a rather tricky thing. I tried to make a picture which really existed in its own time, but which didn't abuse the eye of the audience, and uh, not abuse, alienate the audience by becoming a costume picture. But I made it as though it were happening in its time and the people were accidentally dressed in our own time. That was the intention. Whether it was successful or not is, is for you to tell me. Uh, sir. In working on a project like The Trial, some of your other films where you have written and directed, uh, does Orson Welles, the director, ever get in the way of Orson Welles, the writer, or how closely does one follow the other? I think of it as a happy marriage. <laughs> Uh, seriously, no, I don't think so. Uh, I rewrite when I have a, an original script, and in Shakespeare somebody didn't write it, I am rewriting all the time on the set. And the director never gives me any trouble at all. The trial remains one of Wells's most complicated and also most fully realized works. Not an easy picture, but a rewarding one in the long run. Certainly a most valuable part of Wells's small treasure. So I've lost my case. What of it? You. You're losing too. It's all lost. Lost. So what? There's that sentence, the entire universe, to lunacy. 